Project Management Insights, providing project managers with professional development in the interpersonal skills areas of leadership, team building and communication. Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of Project Management Insights. Today I'm joined by Mark Steele once again. Mark is the author of Projects on Purpose 2.0 and you've probably heard me speaking with Mark once before. And so welcome back, Mark, and thanks for joining me today for this podcast episode. Thank you very much, Karen. It's great to talk to you again. And today we're going to dive into the reasons that purpose is not shared, or I like to call it the, the, the reasons why everybody's not on the same page on our project. And so in your book, I noticed that you have five different reasons. Do you want to start us off with one of those reasons? Sure. Well, maybe we can, I can mention all five and then we can go back. And sure. So the reasons as I, as I list them in the book in chapter six, uh, the first reason is inability to deliver. The second is hidden disagreements. The third are truly hidden motives. The fourth are flawed incentives, which I spend a lot of time elsewhere in the book talking about as well. And the fifth is lack of understanding. And I think there might actually be a sixth that's not in the book, which is resistance to change. Ah, good one. So, so okay, so let's dive into this inability to deliver. Why is that? Why is that a reason for unshared purpose? Well, you know, it doesn't necessarily start out that way at the beginning of the project, but maybe some element of the project overpromised, or they're short resources, or they have other commitments that are interfering with their ability to get the project done. And they realize along the way, wow, we're not gonna, we can't do this. We, we, we can't make it. We're unable to deliver on what we promised. And so, you know, the analogy that I use in the book is that they're like the, the, the kid who doesn't do his homework the night before because he hears there's going to be a snowstorm that night and the snowstorm will cancel school or so he's hoping. And, you know, he wakes up in the morning. And he's like, crap, it didn't snow. Now what do I do? Right. right. <laughs> so they're, they're kind of in that situation. And so. You know, you can see this on, you know, some of my background obviously is in construction projects and they're, they're very litigious, of course. So, you know, you see this a lot on those kinds of projects when um, a subcontractor or the contractor themselves can't deliver in some way. And so they start looking for other reasons, right? They, they want to put blame elsewhere. Oh, well, you know, the electrician delaying the project, not, not the mechanical contractor, or some, actually a lot of times that's the same, but they're, they're, looking for, they're looking for other people to put the blame on and looking for other causes for there to be a project delay, for example. And so their real motive is they're in this mode of, it didn't snow last night. So they, they need to create snow, if you will. Right. They need to create the, create the conditions so that they are let off the hook. And that can be a, a really big project. It can be on a really small project, right? You know, um, you know, a bunch of kids doing a school project and want them to do what they promised to do. Absolutely. So it can it can really uh, it can be a major thing. And it, like I said, it doesn't necessarily start out that they weren't on the same purpose. Although, you know, you could question that because if they were on the same purpose at the beginning, maybe they would have done a better job understanding what they were promising and how important it was to the project. Absolutely. But, but it might not be that they weren't on the original purpose. It's just that they were promised and for whatever reason they can't deliver and they realize that and they, you know, either intentionally or just kind of normal human behavior, <laughs> you know, they, they get defensive and start to try to look elsewhere for blame. Right. Blame, it's a good one. Absolutely a good one. All right, so then number two is hidden disagreement. How does right. this play out? You can see that a lot of times within an organization that, you know, where there are a bunch of different elements in an organization that are working on the same project. Ah, uh, yep. You know, and, you know, the IT department, yeah, they didn't really want to do this project and they don't really care about the project and, they, you know, 
they haven't been convinced that it's an important project, but they're being forced to go along with it, for example. I'm yep. not picking on IT people. No, it's no, just, I get that's it. That's the yep. first department that popped into my head. It could, be any, <laughs> it could be any element in the project that's in this mode. They're forced to go along, but they're just kind of going along because they're being forced to. They're not really committed. They didn't have any buy-in in the project. Yep. You know, and, and in the long run, that's dangerous because they're not really working towards the project's purpose. You know, they're working toward whatever their other purposes are that they think are more important. And right. this is just a sideline for them. Yes. And I think that pri that priority is one of the key things that I've learned about in this space. And you're right. If there's not the, the buy-in to the priority or the reason for doing the project, of course they're not on, on the, in the same, on the same page. Then they're, they're not, you know, going to be right. interested in, in being involved because it doesn't mean anything to them. Well, I think there's an example, Karen, that just came to mind. Um, I think it goes way back to a Tom Peters uh, book. Right. I'm not sure, though, of that. And somebody tells the story of a company, and they make some part for a car, right? And I actually once did a, did a – um, I once did a, an environmental project for a company in the UK and all they made was like the ring that goes around the cylinder. Right. <laughs> yeah, the car. yeah. That's all they made. That, that was all they made, but they made it for a bunch of different car companies. Right? right. So they could, they could be an example of this. And you know, the company was having all sorts of problems and finally the management came out and said, look, look folks, what you don't realize is you're making Rolls Royces. You know, they thought, well, we're just making this making one exactly. part that goes in a car. But then the management linked them up with their maybe their best customer or they were part of the supply chain for Rolls Royce or something. And, and so the management was like, well, no, you make Rolls Royces. And then it, it kind of inspired people and they realized what, what's the purpose of this thing yeah. that we're doing every day is to make this great car that everybody wants. Yes. So I, I, I think... Um, you know, that, that's kind of a way around that, right, is, is to really make sure that people understand the purpose and, and why the purpose is important. Well, that bigger picture is what you described, right. and I think that's a great, it's a great one that, that often gets missed because people often get so focused on their task, their section, their deliverable, and they're not really bought into that because, you know, we do it every day, so as you explained, whereas right. if they understand how that, fits into the bigger picture that can make the difference. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Okay. So truly hidden motives. All they right. sound a this bit is, dangerous. You know, <laughs> this is where it gets a little shady, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you don't want to um, go into a project thinking this is the case. And, you know, I found in, in my experience with dozens and dozens, I, I don't know, maybe hundreds of, projects both good and bad over the years that I've been involved in analyzing, you know, I would say that this is not normally the case, but occasionally there are elements in the project team who, for whatever reason, don't want the project to succeed. Yeah. And they're, and they're keeping that hidden, you know, but there are stakeholders that do not want the project to work. Um, I actually once worked, uh, with a tribal nation, and I'm, I'm trying to be discreet here, um, that was building a set of casinos and hotels. And because they're a government as well as a business, different groups, power groups within the, the, the tribal nation had different controls over different parts of the government. Yeah. And so, you know, you would go out on this project and they would stop a, you know, a project that was worth 70 to $100 million over some little um, rule that they had in a different department. <laughs> they'd come out and inspect the project and they'd shut down this project for three or four days. And, it, and finally, you have to start to ask, well, wait a second, do they, do they actually want this project to succeed? They're making this, their, 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 their government and their business organization are making this 70 to $100 million investment. Does this one group that's part of this organization actually want this project to succeed? And you know, you kind of have to conclude, no, they don't. And, and I have my own example of that. We were doing a Six Sigma project or starting, attempting to start a Six Sigma project where we had to map 
um, a particular claims process. And the team leader of the whole area wouldn't let us do our work. We did 17 iterations of a process map. Right. Because the staff all had different ways of doing things. There was no standardization, which is the idea of the process mapping was to show this, but she kept stopping what was going on. And I eventually got to the point of, of getting the senior managers in the, in the room and saying, we're stopping this project. We can't move forward because this person, this team leader was blocking us. So much. she was changing processes as we were trying to, Six Sigma is about locking processes Right, and and right. to map them, and and she wouldn't do it. And her my my underlying understanding later on was she was too fearful of losing her job. Exactly, I've encountered that in in a past life. Um, I worked for one of the big four accounting firms in a consulting mode there, mm -hmm. and you know a lot of our clients that would bring us in to look at projects and analyze them and and look at the risks and the processes around them were actually brought into like the internal audit mechanism, you know, and in a lot of organizations, the internal audit is automatically looked at as, Oh, it's adversarial. They're coming yeah, in, yeah. you know, we're going to get in trouble. <laughs> type yes. of thing. And so, you know, once we got around the original hurdle of, Nope, we really do know projects and we're engineers and stuff like that. And we're not accountants in this group. Um, so we got the credibility issue under, under, underway. Yeah. There was still always this residual, resistance from some of the stakeholders. Oh, I don't want you looking at my area because if you find something wrong, I'm going to get in trouble. That's kind of right. Thing. Yeah. So it really, you know, and, and we tried to always take the approach of saying, no, we're here to help. You know, we really are here to help. And, you know, everything can always be improved. I mean, you might be doing things 95% bad, you know, best practices, but there's always something that can be improved. Yeah. And it's, and it's not a horrible thing for that to be found out. So I want to dive into number six, the one that's not in the book that we talked okay. about was that resistance okay. to change. Cause I think right. this fits really well into that space, doesn't it? It does, you know, and I was reminded um, recently and did some reading about this concept of homeostasis, which is sort of the built in mechanisms in a system that keep the system from changing. And as we, as we discussed earlier, it's not always a bad thing. I mean, in our bodies, our bodies have homeostasis and it's what keeps our body temperature at 98.6, regardless of whether it's 85 outside or 10 outside, our body tries to keep it at 98.6 and there's all sorts of mechanisms to do that. It's what keeps us breathing, whether we're thinking about breathing or not, which is a really good thing because breathing is good. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, so there are all these built-in mechanisms in our bodies that keep the body from changing, you know, and we encounter these mechanisms in a bad way, for example, let's say we're trying to get healthier and we want to lose weight. Well, our body doesn't want to lose weight. It's got all these built-in mechanisms to prevent massive changes in the body and it employs them to try to prevent us from losing weight. <laughs> so it's the same way within organizations. You know, there are, there are mechanisms there and thought processes and mindsets there that are basically keeping the organization from changing and, and it will resist any change. And let's face it, any project by definition is a change, right? Whether you're building a new facility, you're putting in place a new IT system um, across the board, whether you're developing a new product, any, any project is a change. So I think those, those um, mechanisms can come into play. There's a natural resistance in people and organizations to those types of major changes. And so in that, they don't want to be on the same page because they really don't want the project at all. Right. They don't want the change that comes with it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. So tell me about flawed incentives. Okay. Flawed incentives, you know, and we might have, we might have touched about this in your earlier podcast on assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit. But I've actually worked on projects where, for example, in construction, everything in, in construction is governed by contracts. Right. You know, the ins and so incentives are very clearly laid out by the contracts. Um, it's not always the case in an organization, for example, an organization undertaking an IT project, 
it might not be as clear what the incentives are, but there are. There are incentives within the organization. There are behaviors that are rewarded and behaviors that are punished. There are bonuses set on certain criteria. Yeah. All those, all those types of things. And it's actually not uncommon for there to be incentives for an organization or a sub part of that organization to behave in such a way that's actually contrary to the project's purpose. Right. In one of the examples I think I used in the book, um, I analyzed a linear project. It was a, actually a fiber optic line. So a linear project is one, you know, it's a line, right? So it goes a long distance and it's very narrow. Um, and it's interesting because in any sort of linear project, whether it's a pipeline or a fiber optic cable or some other sort of communications line, um, you know, one of the most important things is securing the right of way for the, you know, from the homeowner, homeowners, you have to have permission. You're going to pass through all these people's property and you need permission. Well, in this project, the company actually had um, two main customers. They had already signed them up. But in order for them to take advantage of those customers and have those customers buy into their service, they needed to finish the project by a certain deadline or else the entire project, it was like 150 miles or so of fiber optic line was basically wasted, okay? Right. Unless they could find other customers, but it wasn't guaranteed that they could. And so they set out to do the project. Well, the, it, it's common in those types of industries. There are spe spe uh, specific consultants whose job is to secure the right of way. Yep. So they will go out and they'll send out letters to all the homeowners along the way. And they'll say, I don't know, I'm making them numbers, but they'll say, we'll give you $5 a foot. And they know that we'll get 23.4% of homeowners to buy off on $5 a foot. And the ones that don't, okay, we'll say, we'll send them, we'll give you $6 a foot. Right. <laughs> and, and they know we'll get another 18% to do that. And right. so they, you know, they, they, they know from experience how to do this. And what they're really doing, if you think about it, right, is they're optimizing length of right of way versus cost to get the right of way. Yep. Okay. Well, the problem is twofold. One, that doesn't optimize time. So if you're on a deadline, that's a problem. Of course. And two, it does not optimize contiguous right of way. Yep. So when you get a little bit further into the project and you don't have the entire right of way secured yet, but you've got in bits and pieces along the entire length, what happens when you say to the contractor, you know, we've got to meet this deadline. We want you to go out there now and work in bits and pieces. I mean, if you know, if you've ever been around one of these projects before, you know, they want to start at one point and they want to blast all the way through with no obstacles the yep. whole way. Yep. Yeah, and they might have river crossings and things like that that they know they have to work around, but they they don't want to be stopped because, well, I, I just went 10 miles and now I've got to stop because I don't have the next 100 yards of property secured as a right of way. Yeah. So it becomes very inefficient in terms of the work and starts to, the costs start to build up and delay starts to build up, right? All of that because the company incentivized the right-of-way contractor in the normal way that they always did it. Probably nobody even thought about it. They just, here's our normal purchase order for doing this. We send it out to these people. And, and, and actually, in interviewing, in interviewing that team, they were proud of how well they had optimized cost versus distance. They were really proud. They had the charts and graphs to show, well, we did, we did this really well. But it delayed the whole project. And when the project was done, the customers were gone. Right. <laughs> Right. So, so what was really important there was getting the project done by the deadline, and that would have been worth spending three times as much on the right of way if they had yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. Done, and know? so that is, that's a bit like what we talked about before around that, like that. There's cross purposes with the different sure. areas. Exactly. You know, One, not understanding the importance or the the need or the the key element, which was the timeline everything exactly. used on the timeline there and they didn't understand that and here that company they got their bonuses because their bonuses were based on optimizing costs versus distance 
right. and they did a great job of it. Right. <laughs> so they received their bonuses, but right. the project failed. Yes. They were actually right. incentivized to do something that was contrary to the purpose of the project. Right. And so the last one in the book is lack of understanding. Sure. And that's something that, you know, is it, pretty easy to understand, right? I mean, somebody just doesn't understand the purpose. Maybe we go back to the Rolls Royce people that we were talking about before. You know, somebody doesn't understand the purpose and how important it is to the organization. Um, and that might be the easiest one to correct, actually. But, you know, purpose has to be clearly communicated and clearly understood by everybody. And they have to understand it in the same way, right? You know, saying they understand it is not always, does not always mean they understand the same thing that management means by here's the purpose. <laughs> right. And that's what I'm saying on the same page, right? right exactly. we, we really are on the same page. Well, how do we ensure that though? Because I mean, we've talked about all these reasons why, why people are not always on the same page. Like what's the best way to, for us to get to that space of ensuring everybody's on the same page now that we have this awareness of the things that disrupt it happen. Sure. Sure. Um, well, in that lack of understanding area, you know, clearly we have to communicate it clearly and then we have to, um, you know, have them communicate it back clearly. Right. right. So to make sure that they understand what it is. And then also uh, with all of these, we have to be observing behaviors whether the behaviors are sub organizations or outside contractors or individuals on a team or whatever, we need to be observing behaviors, not in the big brother kind of sense, but just we need to be watching for any of these areas that could be problematic and any behaviors that might exhibit it, you know, one of these five or six areas. Um, Absolutely. And thanks for that because, you know, the key for this podcast is all about people management. And sure. so I love that you've touched back on behavior because behavior is all about people. And exactly. if we have our head stuck in, well, the timeline's the most important thing, we're missing the key element, the people delivering to the timeline. Exactly. And I think, um, you know, we talked about earlier that overused four square chart that yep. one, one can, it seems like you can turn almost anything into one of those charts. Um, and I was thinking about it earlier and thinking, well, this would fit too, of course like everything else. But if you put lack of alignment on the lower axis, on the right left axis, and you put intentionality on the up down axis, on the Y axis, um, and you divide it into your four squares, right? Then in the lower left, you get unintentional alignment. And that can be problematic because if you don't know what caused the alignment, then you don't know if it's unraveling later. Right. right? And then above that, you get intentional alignment, which is what we're shooting for here. We want intentional alignment. And then I, although I think when they traditionally do these squares, they try to put the good thing on the upper right, but on mine, the good thing's on the upper left. <laughs> um, and then in the lower right, you have unintentional misalignment. Unintentional misalignment. That might be the lack of understanding or other things that we talked about, right? And that might be the easiest one of, to correct. Right you know, in terms of misalignments. And then in the top right, you have intentional misalignment. And that could be, um, you know, the inability to deliver the snow, you know, the snowfall analogy that we used. Right. It could be um, the hidden, hidden, hidden agendas, yep. hidden agendas, that type of thing. And that really, that's the most dangerous one. And it's the most difficult to correct because it won't necessarily initially appear to be what it is. Right. And again, this is where checking on the behaviors is going to be key because you might get a sense of it just through the behavior of the people, person, or a team that you're working with, you exactly. know, day to day on the project. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I've, I love this topic. Uh, it's, it's been dear to my heart for the whole time. And I love that there's some legitimate reasons that we can uh, express in a way that hopefully our listeners are going to understand and um, thank you once again for joining me on this episode of project management insights remember to check out mark's book that's available on amazon projects on purpose 2.0 and um, check out mark's website your website is my website is it's kind of long but quinton project solutions.com all one word and quinton is is q-u-i-n-t-a-i-n 
Beautiful. And if you delve into my website, you'll even find out what a Quinton is if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fun. All right. Well, thank you once again. And uh, remember, everybody, that this podcast is now, um, you can use listening to the episodes for your CPD points for PMI if you are a, a project manager certified through PMI. And I look forward to speaking to you next week for another episode of Project Management Insights. So happy project managing this week. Thank you for listening to this Project Management Insights podcast. Be sure to visit projectmanagementinsight.com and sign up for our monthly newsletter or to receive updates on upcoming training.